welcome to another video lecture. Um, in this 10 minute video lecture, we're trying to get across the main concepts associated with Andrew Jackson. Um, Andrew Jackson, and uh, I'm automatically, I'm forgetting, seventh president of the United States, um, pretty important character in American history. And uh, again, we're going to paint some big, broad strokes. So don't write research papers with this, but maybe just to dip your hand into the uh, water of history, uh, this might be a good start. Um, Andrew Jackson, um, you've got to know a little bit of background about him sometimes on, on state exams and, and, and the high school level. Um, number one, um, we want to associate him with the War of 1812. Um, but you know, prior to that, his, uh, he was a land specta uh, a spectator. Um, he would purchase land and basically he had a lot of interactions, a lot of negative interactions with treaties with Native Americans and maybe uh, kind of getting sweet deals on land deals in Tennessee. Um, he also had in his life up to up to 300 slaves throughout his life. Uh, he was a slave owner, uh, but nevertheless, he went into the military service um, uh, for the War of 1812. And uh, he basically uh, fought in the War of 1812 after it was over. But we don't have to talk about that. I'm um, in the Battle of New Orleans, and that battle um, is really insignificant, other than giving Andrew Jackson kind of the starring, you know, the, I mean, this kind of star figure in American history, and he used that to propel himself into uh, the political world. Um, he also um, is basically the uh, taker of Florida. Um, basically the Seminole tribes were in Florida and actually a lot of slaves would, would, would escape to Florida and uh, sometimes intermarry with the Seminoles and the Spanish were kind of there but they kind of weren't there, nobody was watching. And uh, under the context of kind of protecting slavery and catching slaves that escaped, Andrew Jackson got into Florida. Um, the next thing you know, bada boom, bada bing, uh, we get Florida, um, you know, by conquest, by manifest destiny. And there's the word, right? You've heard that word in your course. You want manifest destiny? Be Andrew Jackson. Go kick some Seminole ass in Florida. Take it. Become the governor. Annex it. And become, you know, I guess it was part of a treaty. But get that thing for the United States, right? Great sh shipping routes and trade and beaches and natural resources. Yada, yada, yada. Um, that launches us into 1824. And again, I'm skipping big things here, but we, we're just doing these strokes, right? Stroke, strokes of big history. So um, in 1824, Andrew Jackson ran for president. He was kind of a dark horse candidate, a candidate nobody thought would do good at all. And he actually did really good in the popular vote. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the popular vote that determines the outcome in the Electoral College. You guys know this from the lecture that I taught you um, or you learned in class. But nevertheless, Andrew Jackson... Um, had three other competitors, one of them being uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and uh, the race ended up getting thrown in the House of Representatives. And there's a constitutional lesson: um, if you don't get 271 electoral votes back then, I don't know what the number was, but if you don't get half plus one, then it goes to the House of Representatives. The House picks the leader, the next president. And for the most time, most times in American history, we have two parties. You know, we started with Feds and Democratic Republicans, and since, uh, you know, uh, 1860, it's pretty much been Republicans and Democrats. Um, but in 1824, there were Whigs and anti-Masons, and there were Democratic Republicans, and there were all there were four big parties, um, or little big parties. And um, Andrew Jackson didn't get picked. It actually came down, I think, Kentucky. Henry Clay was a senator. And even though Kentucky voted for Andrew Jackson, they gave their votes to John Quincy Adams. And then, bada boom, bada bing, John Quincy Adams picks, you know, uh, this Henry Clay character to be his Secretary of State. I wonder if there's a connection. All right, let's go over major vocabulary because Andrew Jackson's going to come back in 1828. He's going to win the presidency. He's also going to win in 1832. So we got a two-termer here. Pretty big deal. Um, number one, let's go through like five basic things that he believes that are on the test. And um, I'm going to go quick because I know I only have ten minutes and I promised you a ten minute lecture. Number one, um, it's called Jacksonian democracy um, because, that's the term, because he believed in the popular vote. For white men, at least white men who didn't own property too, that's the expansion, going from white men who own property to white men who are white men, right? Native Americans, no. African Americans, no. Women, no. Um, not good. That's Jacksonian democracy. I don't even know what the analogy is. <laughs> it's like really good soup, and they bring out tomato soup. It's soup. It ain't really good soup, and we're going to get there, folks. All right, we do electoral college. He was against it. He wanted an amendment against it. He, he talked about it all the time. He never got it. Number two, the spoil system. 
it's going to be on the test. Spoils system. The spoil system is basically not made up by Jackson, but basically what it means is to the winner goes to the spoils. If you win, you get to reap the benefits of winning, especially the presidency. And basically, you know, there's two ways of looking at this. The positive way is that by allowing the president to basically have a high turnover rate with federal officials to come in and wipe the board clean and start to hire new people, you get fresh blood. You get new ideas. You don't get bureaucrats for life. There's less special interest. There's less chances they're going to steal or be greedy and they're going to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, and in the idea of Jacksonian democracy, that's one concept, right? Is that the spoil system allows for, you know, more people being involved in politics, right? It's like term limits almost. The negative part is who are they going to hire? They're going to hire their friends. They're going to hire relatives. They're going to hire people maybe that aren't qualified. So the spoils system is going to last all the way up to like 1888 and we get to know our Pendleton Act and now today it's not who you know. Yes, it is. It's the civil service test, at least for civil service employee jobs, the FBI, the CIA, the, you know, the fire department, um, you know, jobs that are working for the government. It shouldn't be who you know. And um, I got to move on. All right, let's talk about the time. Yeah. You have to know that he was against the National Bank. The National Bank to him, Alexander Hamilton, Schwarzenegger baby, represented the um, Eastern interest. It represented uh, you know big money, big business, and uh, not Western farmers. He was a Western frontiers man. So he vetoed the National Bank. Uh, we won't tell you what happened when he took all the money out and he gave it to the local banks. And uh, we really had no gold to back it up. But nevertheless, he was against the National Bank. He vetoed the National Bank. He supported tariffs. And that's kind of a weird position for a southerner because southerners are against tariffs because remember, tax on French underwear? Tariff is a tax on a foreign good to protect the U.S. manufacturer. But Jackson was a unionist. He believed in the union. He believed in the United States of America. So if Congress passed the tariff and he signed it, you're going to pay the tariff. And South Carolina came up with this concept called nullification. Remember kids in class, I said, if I told you that you had to go to school naked, even if I was your father, what would you tell me? You said bad things. You wouldn't do it, right? You nullified that rule. You said, I have a liberty, that it's more important that I have my liberty that I follow your rule. And that's what South Carolina said. This is the beginning of the Civil War in 1828, guys, right? So what is Andrew Jackson going to do? He's going to almost use force to enforce the tariff acts. That ends up being a compromise, but that's not the concept. The concept is that, you know, nullification comes up. And Jackson said, you can't leave the union. You can't leave the marriage of the Catholic Church. You're married forever. His vice president, Daniel Calhoun, said, you should be able to do that. It's a contract. And you can violate the contract if you violate the terms of the contract. So, nevertheless, he um, supported tariffs. He was against nullification. And the last thing is the Indian Removal Act. Um, in 1832, the Supreme Court actually sided with Native Americans in a court case called Worcester versus Georgia. And it was really the beginning of the Indian Removal Act where they said, Georgia, you can't make Native Americans follow your law. Your law. They have their own law. And Jackson basically said, I don't want to, I can't do this in front of the camera on YouTube, but he put a bad finger up and he said, let me fix my glasses. I'm not going to, you know, enforce your decision. Go ahead, you enforce your decision. He enforced the Indian Removal Act. I can't read Howard's in. Native Americans under Jackson, it's not a good story. Um, 40,000 forcibly removed, um, 4,000 dead on the Trail of Tears. And why? Because he believed that white men, that Western civilization, had to fix the savages. And it was either fix yourself and become like us, or get them out of the way, get the hell out of the way. And that's the Indian Removal Act. And that's Manifest Destiny. You know, I'm not going to say that the effects aren't bad for us in terms of economic nationalism and expanding the economy and the Western frontier and democracy in a certain respect. But, you know, it's on the back of genocide. It's on the back of, you know, things that we shouldn't be proud of, things that we should learn lessons on. And this is big. If you get upset about this, watching this on YouTube, that's not patriotism. Patriotism is being honest and open and understanding where your country's been in order to find out where your country needs to go. So, God, God bless you.